you all who are remaining with us. And we have an excellent uh, panel here to continue and wrap up the discussion. If you'll give me your attention, thank you very much. Um, excuse me, we're continuing on now, please. Thank you. We have no break now. Um, no rest for the oppressed, exactly. But uh, in a certain way, I think we have some of the most exciting folks at the end of the discussion today. We have uh, Jeffrey Sanzenbacher, who's a research economist from Boston College, and he'll be talking about his experience with uh, a number of different reforms, I hope including uh, Connecticut. Bennett Kleinberg, who's here from uh, Prudential Financial, where he's the vice president of product development. We have Diane Garnick, who's the chief income officer from TIA, and David John, who I think everybody knows. He's the senior strategic policy advisor from AARP. And the topic of this, uh, the title of this last session is Lessons from Academia and Industry. And so what I ask folks on this panel to share with us is a few thoughts about uh, what they're seeing in terms of the marketplace, what are some of the obstacles, what are some of the challenges, what are some of the big opportunities that we have to face. So I've asked each person to speak just a few minutes, and we really do want to have the opportunity for Q&A after this. So without further ado, let me start with Jeffrey, and uh, you're on. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Just, just pull it toward you. Okay. Uh, so CRR was actually hired by a few states to assess the feasibility of their proposed automatic IRA program. So we were uh, hired by Connecticut and then by Oregon. And by feasibility, you know, these states, uh, this hasn't really come up much today, but states don't want to spend a lot of money on these programs. They want it to be cost neutral. And so to do that, that means the program has to ultimately pay for itself. And one of the big parameters that's going to help the program do that is to have a decent default contribution rate. So when you have an automatic uh, program and you default people in, the rate that you start them at ends up being the rate that they end up at a lot of the time. And so that parameter, the rate you start them at, is really important for two reasons. I think as Kathleen mentioned, it's important because it helps you save more, obviously. So we want to have a high default rate for the person. But it's also important for the feasibility of the program. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to go out and, and contract with a private sector provider to do the record keeping for this, you know, they they have to charge a per account fee, and the way to recoup that fee is going to be some some fee on the assets of the participants. And if you want that fee to be low, then you've got to have some money in the program. And the quicker you can do that, the better. And so a default contribution rate helps you out there too. And so. One thing that we know from 401k world is that people aren't very responsive to the default contribution rate. When they get put in, if it's 6% or 5% or 3%, they opt out at about the same rate. But we don't really know if that's true for the people who would be affected by these programs because these people are lower income folks. And maybe they, if they get defaulted in at 6%, it scares them away, but at 3%, they feel like they can contribute. And so we were hired by the state of Connecticut to basically do an experiment where we presented workers who are uncovered and who would be affected by these kinds of programs. And some of them saw an enrollment screen where they were asked, you know, you're going to have to contribute 3% of your salary to this program. And some were, were, were shown 5 or 6. Um, some were told it would be auto escalated as high as 10%. And we saw how do they respond. And the results were, you know, pretty encouraging. Uh, we saw that these people behaved a lot like folks in 401k world. They were a little more likely to opt out between 20 and 15 and 20 percent, which is a little higher than in 401ks. But they weren't very responsive to the to default rate. So uh, they were about three or four percentage points more likely to opt out at a three percent rate than a six percent rate. And again, about two or three percentage points more when you went from six to ten. And so they were responsive to it. But it wasn't so much more than what you see in the 401k, and we, we found that encouraging. The, the other thing that we found encouraging is there was a slight relationship between income and response, so poorer people were more likely to opt out at a higher rate than they were at the lower rate, and that, I think, makes sense if you think about the barriers those folks are, are facing. But the groups that we are concerned about, non-white non um, folks who tend to lack coverage more than white folks, uh, women who tend to have less coverage than men, those groups were actually more likely to participate irregardless of the contribution rates. So the, the very people that were targeting by these programs we found were more likely to participate. And so that was also um, encouraging. So I think you know, that's been one part of our research that, that I, I thought was use, useful to talk about. And the, uh, Kathleen also mentioned at the end the question of does forcing people to save result in debt? I think there's less evidence on that to date. 
Um, there are a few studies that suggest that when people save more, they actually do accumulate slightly more debt, but it's offset by the extra savings, so they, they have more on net, but a little bit less, but a little bit less than they might look like they have. Um, but I think that's a great topic for, for future research and one that we're interested in looking at as states start rolling these out. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you. So perfect timing. Um, next we have uh, Bennett Kleinber, who has his five minutes of fame, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Excellent. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And just so happy to be appreciative to be talking to you from Penn, my alma mater, uh, here today. And greetings from Prudential. We are the second largest life insurance company and a top 10 global asset manager with over 1.1 trillion of assets under management. And we provide retirement plans for all sizes of corporations, governments, unions, and consumer groups. So we started the day by hearing about the statistics of the number of people who weren't covered by retirement plans at work. And we wanted to understand more why small businesses don't offer retirement plans. So we did a study. We talked to 850 small business owners who don't offer retirement plans today in firms of between three and 500 employees. And we asked them unprompted, why don't you offer retirement plans? and more than 50% indicated cost as the primary concern. Then we provided them a list of reasons, and the top reasons why they didn't offer retirement plans at work include cost, administrative burden and hassle, and fiduciary concerns. And 29% of them indicated that they didn't understand how retirement plans work. So as you might expect, the rate of what they expect to offer in terms of retirement plans over the next five years, that rate was low. Only 14% said they were likely to offer a retirement plan over the next five years. But when presented with an opportunity to offer a plan with little or no cost and minimal employer responsibility, well then the rate of interest increased by more than 250%. So capitalizing on this interest of offering plans with little or no cost and minimal employer responsibility could go a long way towards narrowing the retirement coverage gap. So let's talk about solutions. We heard today about MEPS, open MEPS, multiple employer plans. These are a way where under a single plan design, multiple employers can band together and achieve the economies of scale that are normally associated with a larger plan. And I talked about the key reasons why small businesses don't offer retirement plans are cost, administrative burden and hassle, and fiduciary concerns. And that's exactly what open maps address. First, from a cost perspective, if you look at the cost of an open map at scale, it could be two thirds less of a cost than a typical small business would play today would pay today. Now think about administrative burden and hassle. MEPS can come with a model plan design that offers automatic enrollment, automatic salary escalation, a default contribution rate, a default investment option, which hopefully will include at least one lifetime income option. From a fiduciary perspective, uh, what MEPS do is they limit the fiduciary responsibility of the small employer to solely timely forwarding of the payroll contributions and then prudent selection of the MET plan sponsor. So you heard it earlier today, it really is true. Today, uh, through the Department of Labor's efforts last fall and then most recently, uh, states and now cities have unique authority to sponsor an open MET. And um, now, IRA type programs are really important programs to narrow the retirement coverage gap and don't take my comments in any way to be uh, negative towards those. But there are benefits from a city's perspective on sponsoring a MEP. If you think about it from the employee's perspective, from the employer's perspective, and then from the city's perspective. From the employee's perspective, and you've heard this, but repetition is good, uh, these are qualified plans and they have higher contribution limits. So 18,000 for a MEP versus 5,500 for an IRA. This includes the ability for an employer to voluntarily make payroll, uh, make employee contributions, and employer contributions can be an important part of retirement savings. Now let's think about it from an employer's perspective. 
there is going to be a need for an employer to undergo a series of expenses to get uh, in a in adopting any plan. And they're not going to be huge, but things like updating payroll systems, sending out required notices, and complying with the co compliance requirements of a state or city plan. There's going to be some amount of expenses. And under Edterra, which a MEP would qualify for, there's a series of tax credits that are available for an employer to start a retirement plan. 50% of costs up to a maximum of 500 per year for the first three years of the program. That tax credit is available in a MEP. It's not currently available under an IRA, although the state can presumably do a tax credit. And then finally, from the state or city's perspective, let's think about the regulatory framework that these are under. So if I'm a small employer, I may be more comfortable under the long-standing regulatory framework of ERISA with all of the consumer protections that you heard about today. And now the state-sponsored or city-sponsored IRA plans, those regulatory frameworks are newer. So there's less of a long-standing known nature of how those work. So as a small employer, I may be more uncomfortable with, uh, with ERISA. So th those are the highlights. Thank you very much. So next we have uh, Diane Garnick, and I'll pass the mic to you. Wonderful. First, you know, it was so nice to have a few people acknowledged for being here today and the type of work that they did. But one of the biggest problems that we will face in the 21st century is retirement security. Because in the past, we've had a scenario where we have had a lot of workers contributing towards defined benefit plans, and the distinction between that generation and this one could not be more stark. In fact, if I think about the defined benefit folks and compare them to every single worker we have out there today that is part of a DC scheme, I don't like to think of them as Gen X, Gen Y, Millennial, whatever the title happens to be. I like to refer to all of those workers as members of the yo-yo generation, which clearly stands for you're on your own. We hear uh, in the news all the time about big employers and what it is that they're doing. Their employees, they're hiring, they're firing, they're laying off. They're certainly not giving big raises. <laughs> so I looked at the S&P 500 because those are the companies that make the news all the time. And I added up every single employee in the S&P 500, whether or not they were in the US. And it ends up, they only represent 32% of our entire workforce. So what we're talking about is the silent majority of small and mid-sized companies. And I want to give you some framework in terms of how big these small companies can end up being. Many of us are, have the wonderful opportunity to use the free app Waze to get here and there, and certainly through the wonderful cities of Philadelphia. Right? When that company was acquired for over a billion dollars, it had a whopping 95 employees. So think about the economic impact that small companies really do have on our society. Now, here's one of the things that we've discovered at TIAA, both through surveying our clients and then through surveying Americans as a whole. It ends up that 28% of those surveyed are currently working and are saving exactly zero for their retirement. Zero. It also ends up that 70% of the people who are saving in their retirement would much, like, would much prefer to be in a defined benefit plan, which is very interesting if you think about it in the following context. The most important attribute that all of us have as Americans is freedom of choice. We talk about it day and night. This is our favorite thing, right? But at the moment of retirement, if I were to ask a 65-year-old would you rather have a defined benefit or a defined contribution? They all raise their hand and they say, I want a DB plan. Well, it ends up, if we can correctly design a DC plan, people have the choice of buying a defined benefit plan at the moment of retirement by virtue of a lifetime income contract or spending all of their money at once. So in fact, if we design these accurately, we are giving people not only the choice that they need, but we're giving them what they actually want. And that is financial security while they are retiring. And the very subtle change here is that we now see 50%
of all of our participants no longer think of their lives as working and then retirement. What they think of it is working and then retiring and realizing they didn't save enough and going back part time <laughs> and realizing they need to be more intellectually stimulated and serving on a, on a committee where apparently we have some openings, right Kathleen? <laughs> <laughs> getting more involved intellectually in our community. And that's exactly what a well-structured DC scheme can provide for all of us. So I commend everybody for spending their day and this beautiful afternoon here today focused on what is going to be the single largest issue that we are donating down to the next generation. Thank you very much, David. Well, as the last person on the last panel of a splendid uh, conference, the words of former Vice President Hubert Humphrey come to mind. Everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. So with that, I have uh, four points I'd like to make. First off, let's look at the what's been proposed, both in the state and city and beyond, in the private sector plans, from the point of view of an employer. Now, one of the first questions that we got when Mark and I were talking about uh, the auto IRA from small business people was, well, will people like automatic enrollment? Will they feel that we're being uh, intrusive in them or things along that line? And what we found through a variety of surveys is that for the 80 to 90 percent of people who were automatically enrolled and stayed in the plan, the popularity was similar to a North Korean election, which <laughs> might or might not have been fixed, but we'll, 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 we won't talk about that. The poll was not. But what was even more interesting was that for the people who opted out, 10, 15 percent or so, still somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 percent plus said that they were glad to see this. So this is a step that employers can take that their employees want. Now what's even more interesting about this is that this is something that employers want to do. If you go back to the controller's statement at the very beginning, where 61% uh, of the Philadelphia businesses don't offer a retirement savings plan of some sort, uh, the big reason that they didn't was because it's too expensive or they don't have time. Now, they don't have time actually translates in most cases to precisely what Bennett was talking about, worries about uh, ERISA, worries about various uh, other things along that line. Now, the interesting thing is when we were developing the auto IRA, we had a major financial that did a poll of employers. And that major financial found that most employers, when they heard about the features of the auto IRA, they, they liked it. This was something that the support actually built, and the pollster that they used uh, actually said this was something that uh, he had very rarely come across, if ever, that the support continued to grow. Now, there's another point here, however. Pew just did a similar survey of uh, employers, and they found both support for this, which is something that we have found in AARP polls of employers in a variety of states, Employers want to offer this, it's just that it's too difficult and it's not their specialty at this point. But what we found in what they found in the Pew plan was that roughly half of the employers who would fall under this kind of a required offering said that they would take the state or the city plan and the other half would go to the private sector. And it was worded in ways that they would go to a private sector ERISA plan. So the two are not it's completely separate in this case. Now, two, one of the values of a group plan, whether it's a MEP, whether it's a state plan, a city plan, or a national plan, should we get one, uh, is that the, the savings are portable. Kathleen referred to 40 cents out of every dollar that disappears eventually. Now, the biggest point where this disappears is when employees move from one company to another. And if they stay in the same plan, rather than a matter of, well, what do you want to do with your money? Give it to me. I'll spend it. It's a matter that, well, yes, of course, your saving will continue when you move to the new employer. So this is a, a huge value, and this also builds 
retirement savings. Number three, point three, is that one of the problems with leakage and one of the problems with the whole thing is that when you have retirement income, that's crucial, but inevitably you're going to have the unexpected expenses that nobody really thought about. The roof leaks, the car broke down, something along that line. So people actually need, both while they're saving and working and afterwards, a pool of emergency savings, non-retirement emergency savings. And one way this could be done is actually to auto-enroll people into two accounts, one of which is an ERISA retirement savings account or a non-ERISA uh, IRA, the other of which is a very liquid emergency fund. Uh, this is variously known as sidecar or split stream or things along that line. And it's uh, being explored actively by a variety of groups, both here and overseas, and has a, a great potential in part because the individuals will be uh, getting some value from this payroll deduction savings while they're still working. Point four, last but not least. We look at, especially those of us who work in retirement, and we tend to think of retirement savings has to be translated into a stream of savings. That in other words, it has to be whether it's a phased withdrawal or an annuity or something like that. And let me suggest that for lower income individuals, there's another alternative, which is that they could retire and live for a couple of years on the retirement savings and delay taking Social Security. Now what that does is to increase their Social Security benefits between six and eight percent for every year that they do that, and then they have a stream of income that is uh, inflation protected. So they, this has a lot of different aspects to it. And as we go forward, the first thing is to get a retirement savings plan that works, and works for most people. Then we have the other issues, the second order issues of the emergency savings, what people do with their savings, and then of course the uh, unspoken question of what do we do with contingent workers, whether that's uh, in the gig economy or uh, people like security guards and kitchen workers whose jobs have been uh, contracted out. So this is the start of a great effort. We have a chance to make a real difference here, but uh, once the city and state plans are implemented, maybe a national plan, that's just the start of the effort. It's not the end. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, set of uh, thoughts to launch our discussion. Um, we'll, we'll clap later with enthusiasm. So I wanted to take the prerequisite of the chair to ask the first question. And given that we're at the University of Pennsylvania, an educational institution, I wanted to ask each of you to talk a little bit about the tension between auto-enrolling people, mandating employers to offer things that unpensioned workers would have to participate in unless they opted out, versus the financial literacy alternative. And maybe not as an alternative, but as an addendum. As they used to say, if you give a man a fish, he'll be well-fed that day. If you teach the man to fish, he'll be well-fed the rest of his life. I don't know what that says about women, but anyway. Um, what we know is a lot of people who are lower wage get into trouble because of payday loans, they don't pay their credit cards, they get into mortgages, they, they rent to own, all sorts of financial challenges that leave them in very bad place, in fact, in debt, as was pointed out earlier. So to my mind, it's not an either or. You don't put give people pensions that don't have pensions without providing financial literacy. Yet many of the state and city plans are silent on who will pay for that, who will be the vehicle for providing that. So I'd be curious in your, um, in your thoughts. So uh, I love that analogy. This is such an important question. And, uh, and the visual that I'd like for everyone to think is imagine you were suddenly ill and brought to the emergency room and you're on a gurney getting rolled into the operating room, and the physician looks down at you and says, so how many stitches do you want? <laughs> you want 10, you want 15? I love the Department of Labor fiduciary ruling is such an important piece of, of um, 
But I want, it's, it's funny, the, it, it's just such an important cha sea change for our entire industry. And at TIAA, I think we're one of the few organizations that are simply applauding it. I think it's so important that people understand that financial literacy is important but not necessary because we don't need, especially low-income workers, we cannot expect them to understand the complexities of finance. We have a responsibility to make sure that people have adequate income based on the level of savings that they were able to achieve. One of the things that we think could help really go a long way in solving some of these problems is to default people into a lifetime income contract. Now, should they default all of their assets? Absolutely not. We know there are emergencies, but we do think that it would make a lot of sense for people to default into lifetime income to the extent that it covers all of their necessities. So rather than ask people about risk preferences, we would love to ask people, how would you like to retire? Do you want to have a comfortable life? Do you want to have a fun life? Or do you want to have a luxurious life? And all three of those lead to different levels of preferences, risk preference. And all three of those lead to different savings rates. But the important thing about classifying those buckets in that way is that everybody can understand that question. And very few people understand what it means to be risk tolerant, risk moderate, aggressive, and the titles vary from firm to firm, right? So I think that's a really important step for us to take on a go-forward basis. Let me make three very quick points, if I may. First off, the, one of the ways that we need to deal with this is to change the statement. The DC statement is an investment statement, and it tells you what your balance is every 90 days. And frankly, unless you're 90 days from retirement, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and it, all it does is to give you the wrong information and the wrong incentive. It needs to be an income statement with income projections. Number two, when do we start? I regard financial literacy as a both and rather than an either or. In other words, it's not either the plan or financial literacy. It's got to be both. My older daughter, Meredith, went to one of the best high schools in the nation. And during that time, she took two courses in photography, two courses in cooking with really interesting results, and... Uh, <laughs> No courses on financial literacy. They were not required. This is not something that you start necessarily when people reach retirement or when they're working. This is something that has to start even earlier. I have seen studies that suggest that the age seven is actually maybe too late in some situations. So that's it. Point three, how do we deliver this? And I think this needs to be delivered as part of a retirement plan. Well, the traditional thing is that you go into a room like this and it's dark and you have a uh, large uh, slide presentation and most people get a really good nap during that period of time. We have a delivery system now with technology where you can receive short video clips at key points in your life. You can actually talk to online to people who are in the same situation as you are and to get to their things. So this is something that needs to be added, frankly, to every retirement plan. But it doesn't necessarily have to be done in the typical dull, boring way that it has been in the past. Thank you. I'll echo a lot of what's been said. Um, I think as the, as the city is thinking about its program, right, there's lots of components. There's coverage, which we spent the whole day talking about, then there's adequacy. So what is the automatic contribution rate going to be? And it's also important to escalate that over time because a 3% or even 5% contribution rate, even if saved for a, a long period of time, may not be adequate to do retirement security. And then finally, thinking about income, right? The goal of this is not to have a bag of cash at retirement because people are not experts in saying, okay, I have a bag of cash, how long am I going to live, how much can I take out each year, and there's hordes of problems associated with that. So it's about creating uh, a retirement income paycheck, 
And so thinking about the distribution phase, whether it's annuitization or there are a number of options, should be part of it as well. So I agree financial literacy is very important, but there's a level of detail that everybody doesn't need to understand everything about it if the defaults work the right way. Jeffrey? Um, I'll say two things. So one of, one of the big issues we ran into in Oregon, and we tried to really help them understand, is that when you were talking about these programs, you do not have a uniform group of people. So in Oregon, we did a statistical analysis that basically should, told them, look, you have three groups of people you need to worry about. One is your prime age white population. You have a very large population of Hispanic people in Oregon, and a lot of them, English is not the first language. And then you have a, a group of people who are 25 and under who may be just out of college and their first job. And that all three of those groups kind of need different education, potentially different languages. Um, and that Oregon was unique in that it had a large Hispanic population, but other states have completely different populations. And New York City you know, has every population imaginable within it. And it's really important, I think, as, a state, as, you, as you kind of think about education, to think about that you have all these different groups of people that need different kinds of education. Um, um, so, let's see, so that was, that was the one thing. And then secondly, I think when you, when you think about the benefits of these programs, I think one of them is that if you look at access to bank accounts across people who don't have coverage versus those who do, people who don't have coverage, about 20% of them don't have any bank account, let alone a retirement account. And so one of the benefits of these programs is that it gets people in the door that they've never crossed before. So they, they kind of, they get access to their first bank account, which happens to be maybe an IRA or maybe a, maybe a, a, an MAP or something like that. And so that also, I think, they need to be educated, obviously, but it also gives them a chance to be educated that maybe wasn't there before. And so that's just, just worth thinking about as a benefit of these things. All right. Now we have a chance for some questions. Raise your hand. I believe there's a mic that will go around. Do we have a microphone? Somebody take it around. And if you'd be so kind, just tell us who you are and who you're with. Yes, sir. My name is Carl Bailey, and I'm from AARP. Uh, my question is that we were speaking of today of a lot of people, different races that do retirement. And one of the things that I have experienced mostly, and we all know that we need a certain amount of education, that the majority of Afro-Americans or the majority of blacks that I have to speak to about a retirement is the first thing that I get, they're going to go bankruptcy. When I get a certain age, my money is not going to be there. So they are very intimidated about investing into retirement because of the previous, I should say, things that they have been exposed to and because of the income they don't think that what difference is two dollars or three dollars going to make a difference if I invest into it. So my problem is, is we all know that they need retirement at a certain age, but have a way that how we could focus on those individuals that feel and think about retirement plan. Thank you. Does anybody want to speak to that? Sure. I'm glad that you brought this topic up. I'd love for you and everyone here to read the November issue of Black Enterprise Magazine where I did an extensive interview and we addressed this issue directly. And one of the misconceptions that we're trying to help people understand is that the decision that people face at retirement is not, should I, is it safe to leave my money in the bank or at an insurance company or at an asset manager. I think in reality, when we talk to people in more depth, it ends up what they're really debating is, is it safe for me to keep, to, to, is it better, more fun, more enjoyable for me to consume everything right now? <laughs> what are the chances that I'm going to live as long as everybody thinks that I'm going to live? That's a legitimate issue because we know that not every race and not every gender and certainly not every ethnicity has the same life expectancy. But in plan, lifetime incomes, um, tables, actuarial tables, use a gender agnostic table. So that could be a tremendous advantage if you think you're going to live very long, like the ladies, <laughs> and potentially a disadvantage if you don't think you're gonna live very long. So I think one of the things that people need to think very carefully about is 
whether it makes sense for them to buy lifetime income in plan or out of plan. Mm -hmm. I think that's really key. Anybody else want to speak to that? Take another question. All right, we'll do just very quickly, one of the things about this is that uh, under the law, personal uh, savings, personal uh, retirement assets are your property. So if someone goes bankrupt, you're not going to lose them necessarily. But one of the problems that we face, and we face this uh, specifically with certain populations, but also overall, especially with low to moderate income people, is they figure, well, I'm going to go into a financial institution and they're going to talk all sorts of uh, complex language and all it really does is a way to take advantage of me. And this is one of the key factors of setting up a plan, whether it's state, city, or whatever, where by definition, this is going to be done for the benefit of the savers and not the benefit of the financial institutions. The fiduciary rule is another step towards this. We have a question in the back row. The young lady in the red the jacket. The young lady in the red jacket. <laughs> So this is my um, plea, and I've said this a number of times, is we could come up a bit for a different world, word for financial literacy or financial education, because I think it covers two different aspects. If you think about wellness um, and being a surgeon, or, or uh, no, medical education, we all want to eat well and exercise. So that is, everybody needs to know how to balance a checkbook and not overspend their paycheck each week. And we could all agree that that's a useful thing to know. That's a different thing for people to know how to invest in 401ks or an IRA. And what I have found over the last five years when I've gotten involved in this, those, that word, financial education, mixes up both the basic you know, how to balance your checkbook with how to invest your retirement security. And so when you say financial literacy doesn't make sense, you're referring to how to invest your 401ks, whereas obviously you do agree it's important to know how to balance your checkbook. So I don't have an answer as to what those two different words would be, but I think it would be helpful if we could distinguish between the two so that we're clear that everybody should know how to do the basics. We should know how to eat well and exercise, but that doesn't mean we know how to um, be neurosurgeons. I, I, I agree with you completely. Right. So, so one, the, of, one of the things that so we've So somebody done, who's good at PR, if they could come up with, aren't you a TIA so, craft and credential? So one I of think the you have a we, good PR department. I would ask you right. to please come up with language and I, I mean, I was at so the here's what we here's what we did beginning okay. last April with the CFA Institute, which is comprised of 265 professionals around the world. Every woman, especially Americans, happens to know that October is breast cancer. We all know this, right? So we started having every April is your financial checkup month. Imagine we had physicians. We know that we're doing well because we go and we get an annual checkup. So what we designated April is the Individual Investor Month. And throughout, last April was the first month that we did, the first year that we did it. And it's all about doing um, financial checkups. What should you be asking? Where are you in, this, in the scheme of life? Where are you in terms of what financial information would be more beneficial now relative to later? So I'll tell you that rather than call it a 401k or a 403b, you know what we would love to call it? I shouldn't say that. You know what I would love to call it? I'm trying to get everyone else to buy in. Are you ready? I would love to call it LISA, which simply stands for Lifetime Income Savings Account. And wouldn't, wouldn't it be so easy to say, look, that fancy bag you're buying today, that great car you're buying today, you're just borrowing from your older self? your future self, it's just, if you think about it, 401k and 403b, it's the only industry in the world that is literally named after a tax code. Mm -hmm. No wonder we intimidate people. Ben, did you want to add 
Oh, I just wanted to mention that that, that that comment just also points out that in plan design, the importance of having a default investment option that's structured correctly because you're right, the financial literacy that we should be doing is more basic. It shouldn't be about which choice do you want. It, for some percentage of the people, they're interested in picking that default fund, but most of the people, it's about getting them into the plan, letting the funds accumulate so they can get to the point where they could sustain their retirement. And so. Uh, having a default fund that's constructed well, that works for the grand majority of people who don't need to understand in great detail all about asset allocation. I was going to say, one of the things that came up earlier was, was trust, I think. And, and mm -hmm. in dealing with that, I think one thing that's come up in state plans is having something called a safety corridor, where you start people out in something that's very riskless, that, that, so that they couldn't really lose money in the first year or two. To build up as something like the Myra um, would be something like that. And so to kind of get over this, this trust that if you, you put money in in the first month, you lose something, that now all of a sudden it's like, I knew that was going to happen, and I'm out of here. And so instead, some kind of safety quarter. I don't know that how seriously any states are considering that, but I think it's something that's at least worth thinking about. I mean, there, there are consequences to it too, which is you get low returns at first, but it's at least worth kind of getting over that hump. So a second row here and then Norm. And just identify yourself if you would. Oh, I'm reluctant to identify myself because louder, I'm, louder. <laughs> I'm slightly reluctant to identify myself because I'm slightly playing hooky <laughs> from work here at this great institution. Um, when you talk about using new media, which is actually uh, what I'm working in, uh, I actually have devices here. Um, there's already things that are broken on the my RA site. I'm looking at like just today, right now. And that's not really hitting your target audience age-wise. I mean, uh, you know, people where it's like time to step on the gas and, and uh, have sort of over 50 contributions, they're not going to websites. And we know this from, from building it. What is being done in terms of uh, really sort of awareness raising and market penetration in not financial literature, not even websites, but things like popular media. I mean, I do not recall seeing any time on any television episode people having that talk about like, oh, well, you know, honey, we gave the money to your college education and now we realize that was really a big mistake. It should have just stayed in our retirement fund. What, what is being done there and what can be done? Go ahead, Bennett. Yeah, so, uh, so some of our media campaigns are, uh, one thing we found very effective, and we've done this campaign and online as well, is most people think of their future self as a stranger. Like, they don't recognize themselves out into the future. And we have a little tool where you can kind of envision yourself at age 90, and, and once people do that, they make that tighter connection to, oh, this is really me. It's not some different person that's going to be 90. And it, it helps move the needle in terms of contributing more and getting them to take action now. So in addition to the intellectual connection, making that emotional connection that, yeah, I may really be 90 and I really have to have money to live. And so maybe I should start thinking more about retirement. Jeffrey, did you want to add? Um, yeah, one thing that I think has been happening somewhat recently is the idea of using a phone app to, to start an IRA. I think, um, I think Uber drivers recently, uh, through Betterment and another company, um, got access to, you know, kind of like you just save automatically to a phone. And like that's how most people now interact with the world is that, that phone. And so I know that some of the states are, are kind of putting out RFPs for, for their plans. And I, I one thing they're hoping is that those kinds of ideas come out where it's not just a sign up on a web page. It's actually, there could be a phone app. There could be stuff like that. So. And I think just to add, we could make saving a lot more fun. One of the realities is saving is not rewarding. It's not fun. You're, you're telling yourself, no, I can't go buy this or that. And so instead, there may be apps that help make it fun, that you're maybe in a competition with your savings buddy, or you have a group of friends that you all agree to save. This has actually been tried in developing countries, and it's quite successful. So I think that's something else we need well, to think of. And, and let me just say, the, the question here is, has a point. I mean, at this point, uh, lower income, uh, say mid-40s or whatever, not necessarily using smartphones. And that is a, a serious problem. The thing is, as we go forward here, their kids are. 
and that's where the real future of this is. One of the beauties of this effort is what we are doing today is not just for the workers of today, but it's for our kids, it's for our grandkids, and frankly, it's for our great-grandkids. Norm? Yeah, um, I have actually two things I wonder, and they're Make not questions. They're, they're both questions. <laughs> um, one is, uh, Kathleen, this is actually a repeat of Kathleen's question, which troubles me, because, and it's one of the questions I try and avoid thinking about it, because it conflicts with what I often write up, you know, say people should do. Um, and what Kathleen said is, you know, if you think about the group of people who are um, not participating in plans now, a very high percentage of that group are low-income people. And what Kathleen says is if you're forcing these people to save, or what she asked, I think, if you're forcing these people to save um, or taking steps to make them save even if they can opt out, which we hope they won't do, um, could we be making their lives worse because it's going to force them to do things that are more destructive than not saving, like running up credit card debt, going to high interest payday loans and, and worse. And when we talk about this as a solution to retirement security, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not looking at the group that maybe can't benefit from this kind of savings and all, but it's really a poverty problem that has to be addressed by, for example, increasing Social Security or increasing minimum wage. And so that, that's, and maybe that's an, enough of a question. But the other question I had was one that was just raised, which the states seem to me to have a tremendous opportunity to deal with the new economy with independent contractors that nobody else has really now. Because these state plans, if they're not ERISA plans, could cover could cover Uber employees. I mean, Uber, I'm, I'm sorry to Uber. Uber independent contractors. And um, I, that's something else I wondered whether people could react to. So could people be hurting themselves and opportunities for the states? Two different questions. Who would like to start? Jeffrey. Like to that one. I, on, the, on the hurting themselves piece, I mean, I think there's a lot of negatives about having the plan designed as a Roth. The big one being there's not this, there's not this incentive to keep it in. One of the positives is that you would hope that if people get in a situation where they need that money really bad, the Roth makes it very easy for them to use it instead of actually taking up credit card debt. So there's a potential there that, that it could actually help alleviate that. And, and that's one of the pluses of it being a Roth. I mean, and there are a lot of other negatives which we've heard about, but that's one of the positives, I think. Um, and so I, I guess that, that's one of my responses, is that by making it a Roth, you do design it in a way that, that may alleviate that to some extent. Got it. So I think um, we know that that lower income people do experience a lot of income volatility. So uh, even if they do have the capacity to save, there is a time well this month income may be tight uh, and in the future income may be higher. So I think the idea that David talked about earlier about a sidecar fund to deal with that income volatility with the short term needs is an idea and then have the rest be a longer term need. Uh, for retirement, and potentially my RA could be a vehicle that could be used uh, for that sidecar savings. In terms of the contingent economy, uh, an option would be to voluntarily join an open MET, a gig economy worker. It could be an open MET could be structured to handle gig economy workers as well. Well, in, in the gig economy, uh, there are also others that are working on this. Uh, for instance, the Lyft drivers have a connection with Honest Dollar, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this is still a very tiny group. Shameless promotion, my Brookings project, the Retirement Security Project, issued a paper about uh, two weeks ago Friday on how to cover uh, contingent workers in retirement savings. Diane? Uh, yeah, in focusing on the contingent workers, I think there's another component that we haven't talked about at all today, but equally important for them to think about saving, and that is the stay-at-home parents. Right now, we have about 22% of Americans that are stay-at-home parents. And by the way, in case you're thinking that they're stay-at-home parents because they have to, because it's important to recognize 11% of moms, stay-at-home moms, are opting to stay out. So they're highly educated women that have the opportunity, and right now their only opportunity to save is the $5,500 cap, right? I would love to have equality and make that an $18,000 cap. 
So one of the things that I think is really important is for when states design these plans to also think about the stay-at-home parents. Pew just finished a study showing for the first time since the 1970s, stay-at-home parents are on the rise. Right? right now, one in seven is a dad, so I don't like to say stay-at-home mom anymore. They're finally making a, you know, themselves known. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I do think we're going to have to wrap it up. We have some final words from uh, Jeff, but please join me in thanking this excellent panel. Well, this is the kind of topic we could obviously talk about um, for days, weeks, many, many more hours than we have in a day, but I appreciate so many people sticking with us all day. I wanted to once again thank my boss, City Controller Alan Buckovitz, for really exercising such great, great leadership on this. For all of our partners, AARP, Wharton, Olivia, who's the best panel facilitator ever, right? She ended up exactly on time and, and structured this so that people really did stick to their uh, stick to their questions and a lot of time for questions. Um, I know that there's more to say, but this is not the last time we're going to be talking about this in Philadelphia. Please join us for some of the financial wellness stuff that we're going to be doing around the city where you have more opportunities for this. And again, thanks everyone for taking time, for coming from Boston and New York, uh, where it's Jason from Seattle. Um, so we had people here from many, many different places. Um, great to convene everybody here. And thanks again to Penn. Uh, and Wharton for really being the backbone here for this for this day. So please go finish off the food, hate to waste, and have a great rest of the day.